Hey guys, it's Hunter. Welcome back to another video. So is it cool again to talk about how much I like Gibson guitars yet? Still no? F*** it. Now between growing up in a country that didn't have a wide selection of Gibsons and up until now thinking that they were super ugly, I've never actually played a proper gold top standard. But for some reason, when I saw it on the wall at Sam Ash, I really wanted to try it. So today, in Hunter Stokes the Fires of Controversy for Views by showcasing a guitar from a company that everyone and their mother has a strong opinion on, thereby inviting a shit show in the comments section. That's the new name of the show, by the way. It's either that or Hunter should stick to the script and not take flu medication right before filming these things. Uh, what the fuck was I talking about? Right, Gold Top. I really like this guitar. Let's take a closer look. And before we get into the review, I want to give a shout out to Braden King and the rest of the amazing patrons for making these videos possible. Between obtaining gear, writing the demo track, scripting, filming, and editing, there's a lot of hours that go into making these, so I really appreciate your support. If you want to directly support these honest reviews as well, link to join the Patreon community is in the description and you get bonus perks as well. There's suggested tiers, but you can also set limits like a dollar a month and that really helps out. And now, let's get into it. So right when the lineup first launched, I made a video on the Les Paul Standard 60s, and I really liked it, although it did have its issues. Besides the flaws inherent to the Les Paul design, this unit specifically, the pickup switch, was wired backward. It actually was wired backward, not just knocked around in shipping because there wasn't enough slack in the wiring to rotate it back around. And because I said I liked it, despite the flaws, all the tinfoil hats came out. Like, how much did you get paid? Why didn't you make an honest review? You know, because shitting on something publicly is considered more honest than actually being honest. I mean, I'll let you in on a secret. Gibson does not pay. Especially not to a YouTuber with like 60,000 subscribers. And extra especially if that YouTuber is gonna be like, yo, this shit is wired backward. Reviewing them is mostly to share my thoughts on them, but it's also not a bad excuse to pull a Gibson off the wall at Sam Ash and spend a few days with one. Especially since most of them, including this $2,500 standard 50s, are sadly a little outside of my current price range. All right, so first things first. For this video, I'm just focusing on the guitar, leaving the company happenings out of it, and already this is an improvement over the 60s I tried. I can confirm the pickup selector is wired the right way. Excellent, off to a good start. Now the reason I picked this one is, I don't know. 
I might be turning into a boomer. You know, for the longest time, I thought Telecasters and Gold Top Les Pauls were just the ugliest. And now, look at the guitars I have lined up for review. The f is going on. Regardless, this being a part of Gibson's original collection, we're of course looking at a very traditional spec sheet. Mahogany body with a maple top, set mahogany neck, and a rosewood fingerboard. Infinitely copied, it's a time-proven combination. The body is no weight relief, so this is a proper Les Paul in all its properly hefty glory. The weight is actually one reason I like Les Paul so much, but I know not everyone's as big a fan. This unit is particularly heavy. It's around 10 glorious pounds, but from a quick check on Sweetwater, it looks like the average is more about nine. Of course, it comes in the gold top finish as well as Heritage Sunnyburst. <laughs> Wait, what? <clears throat> Heritage Cherry Sunburst and Tobacco Burst both with double A maple tops. No surprises when it comes to hardware, aluminum stop bar tailpiece and an ABR tunematic bridge. While the 60s being the more quote unquote modern of the two had Grover Rotomatic tuners, this has the Cluson vintage style ones with snot colored plastic buttons. Super 50s looking. Then all the current production Gibson USA models come with Graptech tusk nuts. I love them, they're well cut, good lubrication. Graptech's nut game is strong. The control knobs have metal position indicators. I really like them, I think they look really classic even though realistically I don't find them all that useful. I'm one of those tone all the way open volume at either 0 or 10 all the time kind of guitarists. Regardless, I appreciate the extra class. And the last classic Gibson feature I really like is the binding over the fret nibs. It serves absolutely no practical purpose whatsoever and is apparently a complete pain to work with during refret jobs, which is something you'll have to worry about now that Gibson have ditched the cryogenically treated frets. But damn, fret nib binding looks cool. There is a bit of a cosmetic issue with the fretboard binding looking a bit chipped and janky from like the 11th to 19th frets. In the same area, there are a couple of tool marks on the fretboard and like red markings. And I point these things out not to be like, oh, look how sh Gibson is, give me them likes and views, boys. This is just what I noticed on the one that I randomly picked off the wall like any other consumer would. I might have been unlucky, which I can accept, but if it's a more common issue, maybe they should look into it because this kind of thing should not be on a $2,500 Gibson. I've never heard of it on an Eastman, so. Just throwing that out there. Because it is a relatively expensive guitar, Gibson have included the standard form-fitting hard case. Now, I don't know when they started doing this, but the lock isn't built into the center latch anymore. Instead, you lock it using the included mini padlock, or you can use one of your own. I like this move a lot. This way, if the lock gets damaged, it's not a difficult repair. You can buy a standard lock anywhere. And also, I can use a TSA-approved lock if I'm traveling with a guitar and need to check it through without having to worry about them breaking into the case by force if they decide to inspect. It. Besides just the tuners, this also has different pickups than the 60s, which we'll get to in a second, but to me, the biggest difference between the two is definitely the neck shape. Like when you just see them all next to each other hanging up on the wall, it's kind of hard to tell which is which. As soon as you get them in your hand though, before even plugging in, fat, rounded neck, it's the 50s, slim taper, it's the 60s. It's been a while since I played a guitar with this thick ass neck. Not gonna lie, I don't find it intolerable. For me, it's not as comfortable as medium thickness necks for like riffing and actually playing stuff, but there's something satisfying about how substantial it feels. The big old blocky neck joint is back. I mean, it is a Les Paul, it's part of the design. Not that it really matters for me because I don't play much lead, but upper fret access isn't great. If it makes you feel any better, it's not that much improved even on the Les Paul Modern. If you play a Les Paul before, you know what you're getting yourself into. I've talked about the fret size before on my other current year Gibson videos, but the medium jumbo listed on the website is a little misleading. They're easily the smallest medium jumbo frets I've ever come across. They're smaller than the medium jumbos on Epiphones, on Harley Bentons. I guess it makes sense on this 50s inspired Les Paul, but I hope if they make a standard 70s with like a volute, they make the frets as large as they are on my 70s custom. This, of course, being a golden era style Gibson, it is, of course, loaded with PAF style humbuckers. For this one, Gibson have opted for a pair of burst buckers, a one in the neck and a two in the bridge. I'm running through my Marshall DSL 100H into a Lancaster Mesa 4x12 IR loaded with vintage 30s.
weird thing about Gibson pickups, I don't know what it is about them, but out of the many, many PAF inspired pickups I've tried, they're consistently some of my least favorites. I have no idea why, because theoretically, if they're all based on PAFs, they're basically all copying each other in terms of specs. Maybe it's just the amps I'm using, but for whatever reason, I'm always either getting really thin or really bassy tones. I can never quite get the right balance or the right tone that I'm looking for. I mean, I think it ends up sounding good in a mix, but when I'm just jamming with it by myself, I can't help but wish they were like, Lawler Imperials. I know a lot of people like them, which is why Gibson has stuck with them for so long. I think this particular iteration has been around since like the early 90s. I mean, fair enough. Why mess with something that works? Luckily though, if you're like me and enjoy the feel of a well-built Les Paul, but maybe not the sound, you're in luck. The original collection guitars all feature hand-soldered wiring, no PCBs, so replacing them yourself is fairly simple. It sounds weird to mention that, like replacing the pickups on a $2,500 guitar, but there's nothing to me, or at least that I've found yet, that captures the essence of a Gibson Les Paul. Love the feel of them, so if this is what I'm going for, I don't mind saving up and then replacing the pickups. Like I did with rocking the Willie Adler Fluent set in the Norlin Custom. But yeah, you know what I mean? Like I feel like a lot of companies make really good, really similar feeling super strats or modern style single cuts, but in terms of like a full thickness Les Paul, nothing quite feels the same as a Gibson. It's not to say better or worse, just different. Maybe like the Japanese Navigator stuff, but I haven't had the pleasure of playing one since legally they can't be distributed in the US. Here if you walk into a store and want to pick out a chunky Les Paul with a vanilla smelling nitro finish, your choice is basically which Gibson. So between the standard 50s and the standard 60s, me personally, being that they're the same price, I have to go with the 60s. As much as the gold top has grown on me, I think I prefer a flame bourbon burst top. And while it's always fun to switch it up with the big chunky necks, my personal preference is still the slim taper. What's great to see is that while the last one had the switch wired backward and this has the weird binding issue. The quality of the build, like how the wood is put together and how it plays is awesome. Like in 2010, I played that year studio when I was trying to decide between that and the ESP Eclipse 2 that I eventually bought. And the Gibson was straight up shit. And so was the one on the wall right next to it. I can't really explain. It just made me feel like not playing it. It felt bad. It felt so bad at that point. I was like, all right, maybe I'm just not a Gibson player. And then a couple years later, I got my 72 Custom and that was an eye opener because it was like, wow, these modern Gibsons, man, they are not good. And if these are any indication, it looks like that at least has been sorted. They might be messing up on the PR front, but they are making good guitars. I recently visited the New Look Nashville facility for the first time during Summer Nam along with Steve from Boston. Austin, and he was telling me how much better it was even compared to last year. Better lighting, more organized, much cleaner. And those changes seem to have really benefited the final products. Now, is it worth $2,500? Eh, I mean, a lot of the price obviously comes from the name on the headstock. Companies like Vola do things around that $2,000 mark that I think have better fit and finish, but they don't make a Les Paul. Basically, if you're the one of like 10 people still watching this video, and you're waiting for my final take on it, it's essentially gonna come down to whether or not you like Les Pauls. They're heavy, the string angle after the nut doesn't automatically mean poor tuning stability, but it's not exactly helpful either. Modern wiring features like coil splitting that are more and more common on even like $250 Harley Bentons are missing. The neck joint is a big old block. As I said in the last one, the design is essentially perfect imperfection and it's been like that since the 1950s. It's flawed, and it's exactly what Les Paul fans wanted. And as a Les Paul fan, I can't wait when I can justify the cost to add a gold top standard to my collection. So if you enjoyed this video, do me a favor and hit the like button, leave your thoughts and your comments down below, subscribe and hit the notification bell if you haven't already, that way you've got the best chance of YouTube letting you know when I upload a new video. Thanks to Luke for mixing everything and to Sam Ash for making this guitar available for the review. Usually I'd say something about merch, social media, the Discord server and Patreon, but I don't feel very well, so I'm gonna go take a nap. Thanks for watching, see you for the next one.